Hi, I'm Russ Camarda, an independent filmmaker and actor in New York, and in between the chances I get to do my creative projects, I love to sit down and talk with other artists to see how it is they do what they do, how they take art and use their craft to reveal truth to an audience. So in this series of conversations, you'll meet some people you may recognize, some people you won't recognize, but they're all independent artists and we'll get in depth in a long form conversation to see how it is they do what they do. Welcome to Art Craft Truth. This time on Art Craft Truth, we dig deep into the craft and training of the actor. Hugh O'Gorman is an actor, director, and writer active in professional theater for 25 years. He's the head of acting at California State University, Long Beach, where he oversees the BA and MFA actor training programs. Hugh has appeared on Broadway, Off-Broadway, Off-Off-Broadway, and over a dozen of the nation's most respected regional theaters and Shakespeare festivals. He's a founding member of New York City's Mint Theater Company. He also starred on AMC's critically acclaimed Emmy Award-winning show Remember When and HBO's Golden Globe and Emmy Award-winning John Adams. He's the author of the book The Keys to Acting, and he runs his own acting studio in Los Angeles, The Praxis Studio. He's also a co-director of the National Alliance of Acting Teachers. So, from Stanislavski and Chekhov to Method, Meisner, and Mamet, Hugh and I will cover it all as far as how a professional actor trains in his craft. I hope you enjoy it. Hugh O'Gorman. Thanks for, uh, for, thanks for doing this. This is, uh, that's an interesting, uh, we got like a cool sci-fi background you got going on there. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it's the zoom 5.5 update. <laughs> and because my wife who's an architect, she's not here right now, but her, her desk is literally three feet away from me. Right. <laughs> and there's a lot of background movement and kids and stuff. So. Right. All, right. All right. So, Hugh, thanks, man. So thanks so much for doing this. Uh, and uh, you come to me courtesy of uh, a very cool uh, young lady, uh, Mackenzie uh, Meehan, who's a terrific actress on uh, uh, right now. She's on uh, on Bull on CBS. And uh, she did she did our podcast. We had a great time. And she spoke very highly of you and uh, and just she trained under you. Correct. Is that am I right? Correct. In fact, we both started this literally the same day at Cal State Long Beach. She was a freshman and it was my first day as a professor. Wow. <laughs> well, that's cool. There you go. Yeah. So, so yeah, you came up. To, so what's cool about this? This is as you, I, I don't know if she, if you got to see any of the other ones that we've done, but I watched a little bit of Lou's cause Lou is, you wow, know, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Lou. So you so you get the idea. It's it's uh, along the lines of actors on actors or actor studio. I really want to get into the craft of things for all these different artists. And what's so cool about you is you are a, a, a professor, a teacher of the craft of acting. So we can really dive into the, you know, the the, the machinery of of how actors do it, different techniques, the one you specifically work through your own style and, and, and others. Um, so we definitely want to get into that. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, right off the bat, before we even get into some of your background, I'd love to talk about the, there's, a, there's sort of a conception with acting. It's sort of this, the, you know, being an actor for all these years, I, I've gotten this, especially in film, there's, we're sort of like the stepchild you know, of the arts where it's like, if you're a musician, well, certainly you had to go to a conservatory and train and learn your whatever. And acting, anybody can do that. You know, we, we sort of get, it's sort of like, well, especially in film, it's like, well, we need a deli guy. Let's just use the deli guy kind of a thing. And the, the craft that we bring and the, and the training and the, and the tools that we bring are often kind of neglected or I shouldn't say that, are, are not appreciated. Um, and you being a trainer of actors, you can speak to what it means when an actor has actual tools to bring to the job. Well, the first word that pops to mind is longevity. Um, I think, well, let me begin by saying I believe everybody is born with the ability to act. I believe that storytelling is innate in the human condition. I think it is part of the collective conscious and unconscious. Um, I also believe individually we have the need to express ourselves and that manifests through different techniques, different art forms, uh, but also physically, emotionally, intuitively as actors. Each person that's born has the ability to do it. Now, then we make the jump to the difference between perhaps an amateur and a professional. 
an amateur in the best sense of the word is ama, right? To love something, to amateur it, is to love it, right? So waiting for Guffman, right? All those, you know, all those actors are beautiful. And how, how what a challenge is professional actors to play, you know, which is also interesting about like Nomad land and we can talk about that later what does it mean to have to work with right. like quote unquote non-actors right. and how good Frances McDormand is at yes. doing that because it's brilliant what she's doing um, but I digress um, so the word longevity is if you're going to have a career jump from being an amateur to a professional craft is the is the sustaining power um, is um, if you're going to jump from medium to medium, if you're going to jump from multi-camera sitcom to single camera drum, dramatic to uh, a Shakespeare festival where you're not mic'd and you're outdoors and you have 2,000 seats to reach, you know, it, it, craft is the ability to adapt over time to the given circumstances that you find yourself in performance-wise. Um, so... Uh, I don't believe that everybody needs to train to be a, a professional actor. I believe there are some people that are, you know, born to it, um, but they tend to stick in one medium, right. uh, and they tend to stick in camera work. Uh, that's a gross generalization, but I think you can get away with being on camera without a lot of deep training. It's a little more challenging to pull off the lead in Twelfth Night at Oregon Shakespeare Festival without any training whatsoever yeah. and sustain that over a, a nine-month contract, right? So, um, so the, you know, there's obviously multiple levels of value of craft, but the immediate one that jumps to mind is longevity of a career of being a professional. Sure. And, and also the, the idea of, like you said, jumping from medium to medium, the, you know, you need to be able to reach in when the stakes get real high and you... You have to do it like that on command. There's, you have to know how to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's talk about your uh, your rise to learning the craft. So were was this always something from childhood all the way through, or is it something you picked up late? Because I saw that eventually when you went to college, you go in psychology, right? Where were you? What was yeah. was this something you were going to do? Right. So I majored in psychology at Cornell in French, and I spent my junior year abroad. And it was actually well, the answer to your question is yes and no because my mother was a Broadway actress. My brother, my my mother, my brother was an artist, a painter, uh, in, in we were in New York City at the time. Um, and my mother had gone trained at Juilliard before it was even in Lincoln Center. It was wow. up on a hundred where the Manhattan School of Music is now. Wow. And my dad was getting his PhD at Columbia, so we grew up in that area on you know uh, by Columbia. And uh, and so my mom was in the opera division, uh, and so she was a color tour of soprano. So I kind of wow. grew up in the world of theater like it was part of you know uh, but it was never anything i was going to do seriously for a living <laughs> like, right. why would you do that like that's crazy right sure um so it was circuitous it was both i mean i primarily spent most of my time in childhood playing soccer oh, really? uh, and and that was my love uh um and i actually attribute most of my success if i had what success i've had as an actor uh to and longevity to to athletics actually to the mental game of of literally sports psychology reading the inner game of tennis when i was a kid wow. and stuff like yeah, that yeah well, because so, you you grew up uh you're a little older than me but you grew up right in when pele came to the yeah, pele came to the cosmos came to the cosmos and the, you know second so, hour absolutely man and it was all borg McEnroe tennis so you that was your uh yeah. that was your influence as a kid right i mean totally yeah. But it was interestingly enough, because I loved my experience at Cornell. It's fantastic four years. Um, but it was actually when I got away from the kind of pre law, pre med, pre HD, pre Goldman Sachs mentality of many college campuses mm -hmm. everywhere. Right? Right. <laughs> and I lived in France and played soccer there and it did a play there. And I'd been doing plays. In fact, very funny, and, or maybe it won't be funny, but it's an anecdote nonetheless, is my freshman year acting teacher at Cornell was Jane Lynch. Wow. <laughs> so, dude, can you imagine? You're a freshman, and you get Jane Lynch. That's and, cool. like, I'm not sure we learned anything about acting, <laughs> but it was fantastic. I'll bet it was a blast. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so so I did acting classes, but I wasn't going to do it. You know, I was just, like, I was, like, fulfilling. I was following, you know, stuff I love to do, but it was actually in Paris living you know away from everybody sure. and kind of you have to spend some time with yourself for the first time and go oh well what do i really want to do in life i was like well i want to be bono but 
<laughs> yeah, right. Bono's already doing yeah. pretty well. He's taking that, that, one. Yeah, that he's... little gig. Right. So, and then I was like, well, let me let me follow this. You know, the, the, of, of that time, the Joseph Campbell stuff. You know, follow your bliss. And right, so, right. Well, let me ask you this I didn't question. give it a time frame, but it was like, yeah, that was it. Let me ask you this question: because your your mother was a, a an opera singer. Now, yeah. that, talk about craft. That is an incredibly disciplined art form. I mean, super, you know, uh, attentive to their instrument and their, did, did that, was that intimidate? Was that something you apply, thought you had to apply as you pursued your, like, did that influence how you looked at how you then went into your craft? Well, in a very funny way, Russ, because you realize very, at a very young age, that you don't have a voice like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, you're like, okay, that, to scratch that off. Right, right? Yeah. Sing out. Bono out. Yeah. Opera out. But all joking aside, yeah, because she, after she, you know, had her family, she would coach out of the apartment in New York. And then my father moved to teach at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. So we moved up there and she taught, you know, she would have clients in the house. And and you hear the, the, the discipline you hear. Um, and I remember her saying over and over again to, to students, uh, you know, I can work on technique with you. I can work on craft, but I can't teach you uh, interpretation. That has mm. to come from your heart, your soul, your being. Right. How do you feel this? How do you feel, you know, Despina the Maid from Cosé Van Tutte? Right. You know, how do you feel her? So, anyways. Fascinating. Yeah. You know, that's a theme that's come up with a lot of different uh, artists that I've worked with. And it comes down to, like, musicians talk about... <laughs> Uh, the groove and and it comes down to dynamics it's like you can all teach you the beat and we can teach you the kind of framework of the craft but within that there's an organic moment to moment thing that you that you're bringing yourself to and yeah it's it's across every art there's this like what separates them is this dynamic engagement like what are you bringing to of you to this this thing you know um, so as you're studying, so you're studying abroad, when are you thinking, when do you think I'm going to go that road? Like, okay, let's go the acting road. Let's do this. So that was, yeah, I was in France um, and I did a play. It was actually an Ionesco play, I believe it was a, uh, and, um, and a bit, very honestly, I was terrified by the thought. I was, you know, like, this is crazy, but I thought if I'm ever going to do it, you know, you do it when you're young and yes. try it. And I knew, here's what I, I, here's how I can answer that. Um, You know, Howard Gardner, who is a professor at Harvard University, has his multiple intelligences. And I think he originally started with seven. I think he's expanded it to nine. You know, if you think about the United States in the 19th, 19th century, you know, industrial model of education that we are thrust, that is thrust (laughs) upon us and we barely make our way through, the SAT is some kind of, you know, measure of what that right. system believes intelligence is, right? right? Um, and if anything, my parents taught me, they taught me to listen to myself and my own abilities. And I knew I probably was not going to become an astrophysicist or a mathematician. Right. So I started to ask myself, how, how do I feel most myself? Or when do I feel most myself? And I realized I loved being out physical on a field. I loved being in front of people performing. I loved listening to my body and doing things physically. And I realized that in 1986 or 85, 86 at this time, there was no future for an American goalkeeper uh, (laughs) to make a living. There is now, you know? That's what I mean. You you just, you you fell right in the wrong slot there, right? (laughs) But I think if, if, if I look back and, you know, Schopenhauer has this thing where you, you look back in your life and it seems random when you're moving through it, but you look back and then you realize, oh, there's chapters in your life. Right. And that moment, and moment by moment, I mean that time, that period of six to 10 months of listening to, oh gosh, I want to listen to, I want to do something psychophysically with my life because I feel most alive and I feel that my intelligence as a human being is most articulated when I do something psychophysically. It's not sitting and reading all day. It's not behind a desk. I knew I didn't want to wear a suit and work for the man. So I was like, well, what can I do? And so that was it. I came back to Cornell and my senior year, I actually left the soccer team uh, kind of in an 
unfortunate. Uh, I'd been the starting goalkeeper for three years and I didn't really have the best relationship with the coach at the time. And I got cast in a play. And then I was like, Oh, so I remember calling my dad and he was like, well, son, adults make their own decisions. It's like, uh, okay. Thanks, so, dad. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, I just, I moved from one field to another, you know? Um, and it was terrible at the time I was sobbing in the, in the telephone booth. Remember back when we had telephone yes, booths? I do remember. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and um but i look back at that time and i go okay it was a leap of faith and here we are 35 years later so. well what's interesting is you know that now i i, I see the theme here because as we're going to talk about technique later there's so many different ones and we'll, we'll kind of delineate them um but the the michael chekhov one that that you kind of lean on there is psychophysical it's very yeah. physical yeah. you know so it came from your soccer you know, Computer. stuff getting into your body and understanding that and that feeling. Interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. So, so what's the step then? Like what, once you've gotten out of the phone booth and wiped the tears from your face, uh, right. what, what do you do? Like, how do you plan? Well, I was taking uh, acting classes to this day. One of my best and dearest friends is Randy Reinholtz. Uh, Randy was a graduate student, uh, at Cornell at the time. And I was in his acting class. Um, and Randy went on to work, you know, as a professional actor and beyond a number of soaps. I don't remember the names of which ones they were, but <clears throat> did some episodic. But then he he started the only Native American equity theater company in the United States called wow. Native Voices. And he uh, started that with his wife, Jean Bruce Scott. And wow. it, they've run it, you know, for the past, I think, 25 to 30 years now out here in LA <clears throat> and um, Randy teaches at San Diego State University he teaches acting to this day and it was really you know Randy said well you know you probably need more training uh, that would mean you know auditioning for graduate programs um, so I did some plays my senior year and then I spent the summer uh, after graduation at the Hangar Theater in Ithaca, New York okay. under Bob Moss. I would like to give a big shout out to Bob <laughs> Moss, who was originally a Playwrights Horizons and NYU and then the Hangar and then Syracuse Stage. And Bob was very encouraging. So it's just people along the way that said, you know, take this step, take that step. And I got into the actor training program at the University of Washington under Jack Clay. All right. So Haiti. let me stop you there. So in these early yeah. sort of transitions along the road, yeah. what are some of the things you are learning are they are they leaning towards different sort of methods or or are you or have you found your thing yet right well outside of the jane lynch experience it's called <laughs> let's call it that <laughs> i'm not sure oh, wait, that's, I mean, that, sounds like jane, a, that, yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a great band the jane lynch experience. you know i will tell this story now and i can only tell it now <laughs> but i ran into jane many many years ago at a store called four eyes out here in la which is on melrose it's a, a eyeglass store right so so and um, so I'm at Four Eyes, and I see Jay, and I walk up. And I'm like, hi, you won't remember me. I was a freshman in your acting class. She turned to me, and she went, did I change your life? <laughs> she walked away. I was like, oh, come on now. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's so, so perfect. Um, so all seriously, I mean, seriously, though, it's, well, what did we, we were reading Uta Hagen at Cornell. Okay. We were reading we, Kristen Linklater in voice class. So it's pretty, you know, early Stanislavski based right. stuff, right. um, which was great. Cause you would do object exercises, um, you know, how to bring your authenticity to the work. Um, we had a, uh, uh, there was a, a wonderful <clears throat> gentleman by the name of Anthony Cornish. He was a guest artist at Cornell and he was from Britain and he, he had a Shakespeare class we took, which I just took to immediately. Yeah. And then we did Two Gentlemen of Verona, right. uh, which I had a small part in because uh, I wasn't a theater major. You know, yeah. it was funny. I'll say this that because, you know, at that time I was going back and forth between the soccer team and the theater department. Right. And on one field, they're like, well, why are you hanging out with all those those jocks? <laughs> and I'm like. And then the other, you know, they're, why are you hanging out with all these theater right. kids? You right. know, I'm like, you're both assholes. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. They don't realize the correlation. <laughs> so, um, so those, it was just Shakespeare. It, we, um, well, we did, you know, we did a lot of student productions, people directed things. And it was great because it was a lot of like just practical, get out there and do it. And, uh, with some, yeah, and yeah. do you find early that you have a facility? Like, do you, do you see early that's like, Hey, you know what? I can, I can, I can swing this bat. I can do this. I, I, f I felt, I knew I was interested in it. 
I knew that I liked being out. I wasn't afraid to be out in front of people. Like I loved being in front of an audience. So that wasn't, Right. And I then I realized, oh well, there's all these things that have to do. Like psychological realism was pretty much there, mm. but then if you're going to do things beyond that, it's like, well, you need to really dig a little deeper. If you're going to really transform yourself and not just repeat yourself and all, you know, not just use your personal habits, then that's that's you know, it's now looking back as a teacher. There's these four steps or stages of technique acquisition. The first is um, unconscious incompetence. <laughs> And then you move to conscious incompetence. <laughs> and then you move to conscious competence. Right. And then finally, where you want to end up in anything you study is unconscious, unconscious competence. competence. I, think I, think, not- I think I'm still in uh, conscious incompetence, basically. <laughs> most of my life. Well, that's where most people quit, right? Because <laughs> yeah, right. they become, you know, because when you don't know what you don't know, you're like, hey. And then you realize, oh. And, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> All right, so right at this point, because I want to get back to your career, but I'm going to go off on tangents when I hear yeah, little things. Yeah, tangents. I love so, them. so let's so let's let's oversimplify some of the the things for the layman out there for the the the, the techniques that a lot of actors use. There's, I mean, uh, it starts basically the modern uh, acting technique, you know, post Shakespeare, you know, and post Chekhov, uh, Anton Chekhov, when modern writing changes. It's Stanislavski. And the the Russian theater and and uh, and that be, brings a sort of realism to acting that hadn't existed before. And when they come to this country and the group theater takes it, it's Strasberg and Stella Adler. And Strasberg is sort of everybody thinks of as the method. He kind of adapted right. his method to Stanislavski's system, um, right. and it's real. Uh, in my opinion, some kind of dime store psychology sometimes. And then there's the Michael Chekhov, who was actually. Uh, Anton Chekhov's nephew, the great writer's yeah. nephew, mm-hmm. and he brings that psychophysical, psychological gesture, all that stuff. Uh, Stella Adler, who was took off from the Strasbourg thing, she 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 put more imagination rather than actual, you know, sense memory type stuff. I mean, I'm oversimplifying this, but this is how they all diverge. And then you get into the the Meisners and the Uta Hagens and the moment-to-moment work, um, playing an action. And the, the place that I eventually found for me that I, I studied was like the practical aesthetics, David Mamet kind of real nuts and right, you know, the Atlantic Theater, Atlantic Theater Company. Company stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> where... How do you see all these different things? And aside from the fact that it was, it came from your soccer background, why did you eventually really kind of hone in on a lot of the the Michael Chekhov sort of psychophysical, psychological gesture stuff? How do you well, look, how do you look at all those different, <clears throat> excuse me, different tools? Yeah, and that's obviously a very American understanding yes, of right. because if you work with the Russians, they're like. Why are you separating all these things? <laughs> you know, I mean, they they were separated because they were different individuals that were a member of the group theater. Right. I mean, so let's let's back it up to what is acting. Most of the acting we do, and I'm generalizing, but is psychological realism. So I don't believe there's such thing as an acting style. I believe any style that is inherent in our art form is baked into the literature, the the source material, the dramatic material that we have to interpret. And unless we're doing our own solo work, we are interpreters. And so um, that all those different things you just mentioned are more or less derivatives of Stanislavski. Right. Now, Stanislavski, God bless him, you know, he gets poo-pooed all the time, especially in academia where everybody wants to do anything but that. Um, he was, I mean, you think about the, the magnitude of the genius of this human being. Yeah. For, I mean, the, the, the opus of work that he left behind is, and, and, the, and the curiosity that began as as an extension of the empirical movement. Because if there was no empirical movement, there was no Stanislavski. So... At that time, in the middle of the 19th century, you had everybody trying to codify and systemize whether it was biology, right, right. and evolution, right. or whether it, with Darwin, or whether it was Freud with psychology, right. or what have you. Everybody was looking at a system, systemized version. How do we put what our, our right. field of study into some kind of codification and an understandable system, which is why Stanislavski called it a system. Right. 
Um, that exploration is extraordinary. I realize now at this age of my life what that means, that he kept, and one of the reasons he didn't want to publish a book, and he really resisted it for most of his life, he, he just kind of gave in to the editors, he says, how can I write something down that's in constant evolution that is really an exploration? Mm. And I think baked in the, in the middle of all that is, is the beginner's mind. Mm. And I think the best human beings that I've ever worked with in any field constantly go back to that beginner's mind. They work from there. They, they don't, they don't, it's, it's the lack of ego about the yes. work. It's, it's the deep curiosity yes. about, and I, and I love teaching acting as much as I love acting because I probably love acting itself now more than I ever did in my life because I'm not acting as much. <laughs> and I can kind of put my own actor ego aside and go, well, what is it? You can't put it in a cup. Right. You can't put acting in a cup. So what is it? Right, right, like, right. And the great thing, if you kind of take all those amazing artists that you just named, all those people, and whether you sign up for one t approach or another, they all were were pioneers in their own regard. Right. You know, you look at what Meisner did, and he took the extension of that. He said, how do we actually work on playing action? How do we actually right. get our attention off ourselves in service of the story? Right. Um. So, I, I mean, personally, I kind of believe that if you have to poo-poo another methodology, you're probably not doing your own, you know what I mean? Like, right. like okay, like Strasberg, he's, you know, he studied with Maria Ospenskaya and Boloslavsky for about six months at the American Laboratory Theater, right? They were expats right. that jumped the ship from the 1923 um, Moscow Art Theater production. So he really didn't understand Stanislavski. <laughs> right. He was interested in the psychology of Thibault uh, Ribot, Thibault Ribot, 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 uh, the French psychologist uh, Theodore Ribot, that's his name, who, who actually discovered the repeatability of emotion. Mm. And Stanislavski got interested in that, and then Strasbourg really went down that rabbit hole. Right. Now, my early work involved that. Was it helpful? Absolutely. Sure. Did it, when you have to do when you have to do the actor studio um, progression of starting with creating an orange, I mean, you know, how can you play Hamlet if you can't recreate the orange that's in was in your hand, right? right. right. And so this sense memory progression, there's a serious value to that. Right. There's a spec it demands specificity. It demands precision. Art is not sloppy. Right. It, it works on a developing, developing the imagination, going from an orange to eventually the shower to, you know, this whole sure, progression right. that you move through. So they all have their value. Um, over time, personally, both as an actor and as a teacher, I've realized that the power of the imagination is just where it's at. Yes. And so the more you can engage the imagination and the work you can do to develop that and how underdeveloped it is in, in the United States in terms of education. I mean, where do you go to the imagination school? Like, where is that? Right. You're lucky if you have a cool teacher that's like, do this stuff when you're growing up and, or, you know. Right. Well, that, that's why I always believe that, I mean, it's, it's, it's self-evident in the doing of it. They're all, like I said, like you said, all those tools are valuable perhaps for different moments, you know, that sense memory uh, in a, in a film in five seconds, you know, in a shot film shot out of continuity and your cat, your, your brother died or whatever in the, in the scene and ready go. If you can access those things quickly without the benefit of, I mean, th those are valuable tools, but you're right. The imagination to me, like I, uh, you know, the, from the mammoth school, the whole, as if idea of it, it's, it's not something that actually happened, but something that could have happened. It's the, you know, it's the argument you had in the elevator after you left the boss's office. And right. we, we, we all can, we all do that. We all have that. And it removes the, the, eat the, the thinking completely because you're automatically into the moment and your imagination is creating all the, that's the right. physical stuff. So the more we can remove that frontal lobe, I think, you know, yeah. that's the whole thing. Well, then we're, we're back to Stanislavski, right? I mean, that's the magic if, that's the if, right. and it's the, the trigger into, into the imagination. 
Um, and again, you know, his work on that is extraordinary. It's, yeah, it's the way the brain works now. It's interesting because we now know science is kind of catching up with the arts, right? That what artists knew back in the day when they were working, they kind of just intuited and they followed their impulses. Now we know that the brain works that way. If I say, I'm Hamlet, my brain goes, no, you're not. You're Hugo Gorman. You're born in Mount Sinai Hospital. You know, blah, 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 blah. You're, you know. If I go, it's as if I'm Hamlet, right. then, oh, cool, you know, right. and the brain opens up, actually. Right. Now, what's interesting to me, and, and it's a function of that moment in history, because before that, like you said, science, uh, architecture, uh, that, and the arts were a different, you know, Shakespearean acting you know, traditional sort of back when they started were all were gesture, you know, and it was it was a different kind of thing, you know, it was, but they didn't look at it the way Stanislavski did the, the realism of the art changed in that moment. Um, I wonder what you think of that shift? What, what do you think about well, why what that shift was? It, it's interesting. Well, I think again, it goes back to the writing, I think, right, as an actor, what what our job is is to take whatever script we've been given. If, if you give an actor uh, an Ionesco script or a Brecht Brecht script, they're going to approach it or you know beck it but radically different than you know Miller, Lynn Nottage. Right. You even go to Susan Laurie Parks. You can't you can't going from Lynn Nottage to Susan Laurie Parks. There's different the way they write. There's different structures and rhythms in, in there and so our job is to take that interpret that and then move go go to their world right, right and articulate the world as best we understand it right. that they wrote so the pivot point you're talking about Stanislavski was in reaction to this movement to verisimilitude or you know psychological realism right now Ibsen you know uh, because prior to Ibsen Nobody looked up on the stage and went, oh, that's like my life. Right. Right? You don't look at, like, the Scottish play and go, hey, that's just, like, yeah. things at home. And also, <laughs> at least, I hope not. Yeah, let's hope not. And also, isn't, isn't that the shift in, in that, that shift in writing is subtext exists for the first time. Right. Like, Shakespeare, when, it, when it's up, it's like, I'm going to kill you. That's pretty much what he means. There's no, there's no, you know, you're saying what you mean, you're doing it. And the writing shifted into, this is how people really talk. They don't always say what they're saying. And right. that changed the way everything was done, right? Of course. So your example you just gave is Hamlet's advice to the players, suit the action to the word and the word to the action. So in Shakespeare, the action lives on the line. Right. It lives in the words. Then what you're talking about, the move, the move to subtext or psychological realism, is uh, and the, a Russian teacher that I've studied a lot with uh, named Slava Dolkachev, who's at the New Theater of Moscow. He's still the artistic director there. He's former artistic director of the Moscow Art Theater. We hired him a lot with the National Alliance of Acting Teachers in the summer to teach really, you know, Maria uh, Ospin uh, Knebel's work. Um, uh, but he would say a lot of times, we think not that which we say, we say not that which we do, we do not that which we want, and we do it all the time. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> right? Which is, we never really say what we mean. Never. So, you know, the, the, the exception of that is, you know, hold the bus yes, when right. you know, my inner line of action and my gesture and everything is on the line, right. but most of the time we don't say that. Right. So, yes, yeah, so this sort of not on the nose writing changes the way actors now approach text. And Stanislavski's right. at the at the forefront of that, and then all these other people we mentioned come out of that with different sort of nuanced uh, approaches to how maybe to make that applicable in the real right. world. But to go to your original question, uh, Russ, Michael Chekhov writes, uh, and I think he doesn't mean this in a disparaging way. I think he means this in a very positive way. He said Stanislavski's work is like high school, and mine is like university. And by that, I think he means you have to understand as an actor, there's an event in every scene. It's a dramatic event. It's the change of one action to a new action. Uh, it's baked into the, the script. It's there. And Stanislavski got a clear uh, methodology for analyzing this. Then our job is to attach an action to make that event happen that's relative to the other character in the scene. You've got to be able to change them. You've got to be able to, to release your energy onto them in pursuit of this, what we call the objective, which makes the event happen. 
Then once you're able to do that with consistency, consistency, reliability, repeatability, then you can go, okay, how is this human being different from me? Mm-hmm. How is this human being over here? How do I transform myself? And I think that's really where the work of Michael Chekhov adds that booster rocket to the work, which is I can really transform myself under imaginary circumstances. So I'm not just playing off my own, you know, quotidian behavior. So let's talk about the word action, because we use it a lot of different ways uh, in, in this to play the act. I mean, there's playing an action, in other words, something to achieve something you can physically achieve uh, psychologically on another character in a layman's way of explaining it. I, I, I want to, I want to put this guy in his place. I want to, that's playing an action, but then there's physical action, you know, uh, right. something physically, you know, uh, for people who, who used to watch, who watch Brando, he's always, he's always got some physical action that's taking his, his, uh, his concentration off himself. You know, he's crushing a walnut or he's playing with a glove or whatever. So how do you, what do you use? What's your way to help define the word action for actors? Right. So it's interesting you say this because I'm now I'm just publishing a book on this called Acting Action. All right. a primary actor. Cool. Uh, and it, I literally handed in the manuscript uh, for the last edit yesterday. Look at me go. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, what you just described, the first part, I would say, is playing action, how you're going to change the other actor. In, and the second part is an activity. It's a psycho. It would be a psychological activity or psychophysical activity. But so right now you and I are in an event. You can call this event an interview. You can call it a podcast. Every scene has one event. And the playwright put that event in the scene very specifically. They're all events are a noun. So it's either a reconciliation, confession, uh, fight, um, betrayal, and pretty much there's only 12 scenes that have ever been written, right? <laughs> and it's just, they're rewritten over and over again by different individual idiosyncratic voices as they, they should be. So our job, like you and I, our inner line of action, we're resp- listening and responding. And most of what I'm doing is reacting to you. Right. Right? So, but we know in an event called an interview, our inner line of action, we know what we're doing. Right. So even if I pick up my coffee, even if I do this, even if I do one of the Brando-esque <laughs> kind of qualities that you just described, I my inner line of action hasn't changed. I'm still in the event called an interview. Right. So what I find most of what I spend my time doing with, with young actors and even coaching professional <laughs> actors in some of the studios here in LA is getting them to reconnect to the action of really what is, and Ron Van Lu, the you know fabled acting teacher taught at NYU for many years, 30 years, and then Yale drama for many years, and now is at Columbia, has this wonderful expression that he uses. Is, how is the character moving their life forward now? How are they organizing all their energy, their uh, being, their physicality to move their life forward? Mm. And that, what they do to do that, is the action. Um, then very specifically, to get into the minutia of, like, down the rabbit hole of, like, what we're doing in the moment-to-moment work, mostly what I teach, especially to young actors, is what Earl Gister and Lloyd Richards taught, uh, who were students of Paul Mann. And Paul Mann was a member of the, act, uh, the, the group theater. And so he was there with these people, Stella and all. The, and so he was his investigation of action is it's a very specific definition, which is playing action is an exchange of energy between two actors to make the other actor feel something. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I'm on you there. I, that's what I think it is. It's, it's, right. it's simplified in my mind is, you know, what's literally going on? What do I want? How am I going to get it? And it's the, right. the choice of how am I going to get it from that guy right. or girl is the, is the choice of action. And it's, that's the talent, I guess, is like, what's the choice you're going to make and how you're going to get that object, how you're going right. to achieve it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So cool. So we're going to, I love this. This is, I'm like geeking out on my acting stuff here. It's so fun. So we'll get back around to your career here for a second. So 
when do you start uh, working as an actor where you're where you're you're saying, OK, I'm going to get into the mix of it. Is it in New York? Do you go to New York and eventually? Yeah. Do and what do you do? Um, so so I was in Seattle. I spent three years in Seattle at the uh, University of Washington there under the master acting teacher, Jack Clay some amazing teachers, Judy Dickerson, who's still, she's an onset coach for the best people in the business right now to this day. She, you know, Russell Crowe, you know, works with her all the time. She was our voice and speech teacher. We have Max Dixon, some other, uh, Kathy Madden, one of the best Alexander teachers in first the country. Of all, first of all, let me stop you here, because before we even get in, get you out of Seattle, I see that you like being a student. I love it. I, yeah, I mean, it, you went from one to, I mean, what is it about that? You know, it's interesting you put your finger on that. I think great teachers are, are great students. I agree. And I think you cannot be an effective... You can be an instructor. You can, you can transmit intellectual knowledge. You know, the whole sage on a stage BS. Right. You cannot be an inspiring role model for how to live in a craft unless you have lived in that and know how to live in it and have surrendered to it. Mm. Mm. And we run an MFA program uh, out here in Cal State Long Beach. Uh, so we train our undergrads, BA, BFA, for the business. Uh, and about, I don't know, over a decade ago, we made a decision to get out of the MFA after training business and focus on Ever since I took over the program here in 2002, we would have mid-career professionals who, I've got to tell this story, the first day, literally the first day teaching, I met Mackenzie Meehan. <laughs> yes. Right. right. I cast her in, a, I was directing The Blue Room, David Hare's uh, take on La Ronde. And cast her because she's amazing, right? It's not like I taught Mackenzie a lot, but she's a very hugely yeah. talented uh, actor. So, um, but, and then on that, literally that same week, I started teaching in the grad program. And I walked in to teach the grad class on the first day. And there was an actor who I knew in there. And her name is Lauren Thompson. And I was terrified. I was like, she, we had the same agent. You know, <laughs> I'd seen her in productions in New York with it. I was like, I said, I took her side after this. I was like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know? She's like, I'm your student. I'm like, I started to melt. I was like, oh my God. Like the, you know, the fear every teacher has of being a fraud. Yes. Like, how am I going to teach this human being? Well, I say that because you realize, wow, when someone's in the room like that, you have to step up your game, one. Uh, but then two, we realized in Long Beach that we had all these wonderful actors from L.A., who had never gotten an MFA, mm -hmm. but they're actually the people that should be in the room with young people because they walk the walk. They know how to solve the problem from the inside. They just don't have experience teaching. Right. So we redesigned our entire program. And for the past more than 10 years now, we, we train you know, professional mid-career actors to become teachers of acting or, or movement or voice and speech right. or what have you. And I say all because that. Because that is a craft teaching itself oh, is, is it's, of course it's i mean it's it's an art in and of itself right. um um and i'm humbly stumbling through it 20 years now into teaching right and um but the, i say all that because when i look at who i believe are have become great teachers and who will make great teachers it's the ones that in the moment will surrender to become a student mm. and they just go it's not I know this. I don't have to, you know, like I'll be anybody's student. So the fact that you put your finger on that, I think that's exactly it, Russ. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I, and on, on a more meta level, I think it speaks to, it's what we try and do in the craft. That's what we try and do in life is I always go back to this. And, and with every artist I've interviewed, it's, if you can, if you can let go of your preconceived ego driven version of what you think you are what you think this piece is what you think this piece of painting is this sculpture this this act this 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 performance letting that go mm -hmm. and allowing it to speak to you mm -hmm. so that you're informed by it rather than you're hanging and i think it's the same thing there it, it, it applies to everything so if you can surrender to be in bliss as a student 
you're going to be a fantastic teacher because you, you're going to yeah. absorb things you never would have gotten before. That's right. And in that particular case with that one actor, I mean, as amazing as she was, no matter what, I mean, you know, uh, uh, whoever uh, uh, Mookie Betts out there in L.A. takes the same batting practice that the kid in Little League. T I mean, the strokes yeah. are the same. It's just, you know. And I, and I just want to say I'm very happy that Mookie's out here. I just want to say that. I was going to say, I, I'm, a Met, I'm a Met fan, but I, I'm, I'm, okay. <laughs> I'll give you your guy. You got your guy and you're... You got the title, so it's all right. But the, but the point is that the practice yeah. is the same. The fundamentals are the same. So yeah. you, you can always learn. Um, all right. So yeah. let's get you out of – Let's. so we left you in Seattle. When do you get back to start taking this as a career and saying, I'm going to get up there right. and do it? So um, each – well, not every summer, but the summers after graduate, each year of graduate school, we did some work. And I, and I just want to talk about one summer because it's really weird um, – I was not, because I wasn't a drama kid, I wasn't a theater major, I got to my grad program and I, I was like, ooh, I got some catching up to do. But I trusted myself and I knew I was a slow learner. I, I have marathon energy from athletics. I'm like, okay, I understand showing up every day. I, sh I understand being the first person in the room and the last person to leave. And I understand what it's like to lose a game and, and hear the word no over and over and over again. And God bless these people that I studied with for many years in Seattle because I love them all very dearly. But a lot of them didn't want to hear the word no. And, and I kind of looked at that and went, okay, we'll see how long that lasts. So I kind of had this vision of like, I knew I was kind of behind the pack now, but the race is long. Right. Um, and one summer, I say all that because I was not, all my other classmates were cast in summer Shakespeare festivals after our first year. And I was not, and I was devastated. And I was like, fuck, man, mm -hmm. you're going to have to eat some humble pie now and really live what you think you, you, you know, believe in. But I didn't know, unbeknownst to me, the head of our program, Jack Clay, had organized this amazing summer where the best acting teachers in the country came to do an actor intensive, which is, interestingly enough, the thing I run now for the, wow. the National Alliance of Acting Teachers. Wow. And I met Carol Rosenfeld, who is at HB Studio, still to this day, and Carol's become a dear friend. We did object exercises now the, the, there was me and two other or three other actors that were demo actors and then there was a room full of acting teachers and then these master acting teachers mm. from the neighborhood playhouse wow. uh, uh, john len from the uh, from the west coast actor studio um uh, robert benedetti all these other people and so i spent these weeks learning all these techniques and i was never happier Wow. And I realized that, you know, as an actor now, I'd rather be in rehearsal than in performance. <laughs> like, I don't, I always joke, I don't need to perform. My parents loved me, you know? Right, right. No, wow. I have loving parents, but I love rehearsal. <laughs> wow. See, I'm the total opposite, man. If I, I, I love, uh, I love working on it a little bit, but man, when it's done, I like when it's done. Are we done? Yeah. I like, yeah. I like that part. But you are well, the. Which is interesting, Russ, probably why. I'm teaching that, yes. you know, like, I, I, because I'm just interested in being in the room. I'm interested in human potential. Yes. And I don't care if it's the soccer field. I don't care if it's my kids. I don't care if it's a relationship within my marriage. It, it's about potential. It's about always expanding who we are as human beings. You can call it acting class. You can, I mean, it's really about human potential, but I digress. So Unfortunately, uh, my my senior my last year of graduate school, I had I had actually been hired by a Shakespeare festival, which was great. So I was going to go do that, but my father had passed away uh, right as I was graduating. Wow. Um, and uh, his, my parents were back east, and my brother had recently passed away. Um, so uh, my mom was by herself. Wow. So I realized I needed to go back east sure. so i had planned originally after the shakespeare festival which i did the montana shakespeare festival to go to la but i moved to new york back to new york to be wow. with my mom um it just so happened that my best friend from childhood was moving to new york after his graduate program or whatever and we needed we got a, an apartment together and you know just shy of harlem and 100 and morningside heights and 123rd street and that's it you know started working there hit the ground running in new york just the circumstances yeah. of life um, just to back up before we get you to New York, because it's something fascinated yeah. me there. Uh, I, I love all star games. So what fascinated me about that, where all the all the great acting teachers came, did you yeah. see, was there any 
was there any kind of ego play on different what like we spoke earlier about people poo-pooing different tech how did that work how did the how did the neighborhood playhouse guy mix with the actor studio guy from i mean did you notice any kind of interesting interplay between those different well people? you know i think well first of all jack very strategically had them come on different weeks right <laughs> so <laughs> i think that was probably a, yeah. you know not a coincidence like one uh, guy didn't walk in and said everything that guy just said is bullshit <laughs> <laughs> well, but they did talk about the differences in the approach. So, for example, I can remember to this day in the neighborhood playhouse, right? Um, you know that Which preparation. Is Sanford Meisner. Uh, for yeah, yeah, Sanford Meisner. Uh, fundamentally, you're encouraged to daydream, to fantasize, to go backstage and let your imagination. But there is, I, I appreciate it now as an older actor, there's a freedom to that. Um, I think sometimes as a younger actor, you're like, yeah, but. Like, I need a little something, like a little bit, give me a little bit more. And then you've got the actor studio side, which is, okay, are you going to personalize an image? Mm. Are you going to do a sense memory? Mm. Are you going to do an effective memory? And the only effective memory I've ever done in my life, I did with John Lenn during that, uh, that workshop. Um, and I don't recommend, it's not for me. I don't need All to. Right. So, so again, for the layman, for the general public, this is why we do yeah. this show. Um, explain if you can sense memory and effective memory these are this is where some folks again I, i'm guilty of saying yeah. sometimes there's a little dime store psychology stuff here that that they got into back then but it, it is effective so just give us what that is right well so an effective mem well sense memory is very i think actually very useful for an actor yes. um which is the recreation using your senses and your imagination so for example in defense of Strasberg with the sense memory, or early Stanislavski, which is what we're really talking about, to recreate the orange is this, so. I'm trying to recreate using the senses: weight, right, size, space, touch. What is it like to feel that there's an orange in my hand? But it really is an imagination exercise because right. there's no orange in my hand, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? As far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so. So even there, you're engaging the imagination. Right. An effective memory is to recreate an emotional experience right. by recreating the sensory, like you're re-triggering yourself right. in a way. Right. It could be traumatic. It could, not, it could be very happy. It could be, you know, the first time you made love or something. So it doesn't have to be a bad thing, right? right? But it's using deep personal experiences through your senses to trigger the emotional life, like Thierry Rudeau Ribot was saying with the French psychologist, to recreate an emotion. Right. Now, Chekhov, Michael Chekhov has a very specific response to that, which is that is completely unnecessary. And in fact, that is like trying to pull uh, dry lint out of your pocket. <laughs> That's actually the image that Chekhov gives. Why don't you go pick some dry lint out of your pocket? Right. And I... Uh, you know, over time. But, you know, at the same time, I remember I was guest starring on ER and we had a three minute steady cam shot. I just had this scene where I had to say goodbye to my wife on the deathbed in the hospital. You know, I met my wife two, two hours earlier in hair and makeup. Hey, I'm Hugh. Hi, I'm Betty, whatever. You know, <laughs> And then we have to like say goodbye to each other. And Anthony Edwards is a three minute steady cam shot. And he wants to go home to his kids. Right. And I, you know, and I sitting there, you know, on the deathbed and the, the director comes up to me and goes, um, can you do what you did in the audition? And I was like, Oh God, what, 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 did, what, I was, what did I do in the audition? What was that? He goes, you cried. Yeah. And I was like, Oh yeah. Like now, yeah. <laughs> he's like, yeah, great. We're going to go reset that steady cam shot with Anthony Edwards who wants to go home to his wife and we're going to do that and come in and then you cry, right? right. <laughs> like, so what did I do? I imagined it's as if right. I was saying goodbye to my real wife right. as I'm looking at this actress who I just met. Right. So tell me, is that my imagination or is that personalization? Right. Well, I'll tell you, you know, like, like you said, and I often, I, I make the mistake of using the incorrect terms there, I call effective memory, sense memory, but you, you, you delineated it and cleared it up for all of us. But yeah, effective memory, like you said, in those, it's like the rip, it's like the emergency rip cord in a situation like that, where you can go, okay, what did the, what did the carpet look like? What did the room smell like when the, you know, and, and because your emotions are kind of stored in your nervous system, if right. you can find that 
thing that's not directly attached to the actual moment of your life, but it's sort of the central thing. But, but I have something to say about that, Russ, which is, is even what I just described, what I did on ER, I, I think is still my imagination. Oh, no, yeah. What, what you did was definitely an as you, 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 know, you substituted sort of your wife for that. That's, yeah. that's right. <clears throat> and that's a substitution. That's correct. And that's what Udo would call it, right? right. That's what. Right. Um, so, um, correct. Sorry. And, um, um, but this, the idea of the effective memory, uh, the reason I don't choose to use it as a teacher or as an actor, well, one, I just think we're living in an environment where we have to respect people have traumas yes. and that they come into the classroom yes. um, and, and you don't know. And I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm an acting teacher. <clears throat> and so even in the actor studio, they had this seven year rule, which was don't use don't use a, an image or a trauma that's within seven years. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. So even Strasberg was saying it should be, you should be distanced, but I don't even think it's healthy to do that, but that's fine. It's just me. Right. But the real reason I say that is actually not because of that. It's because as soon as you do that, you leave the world of the play. Right. Right. Your, your bullshit from whenever, no matter what it's doing to you now in the moment, is not in the play. Right. That's right. You're absolutely right. And the, and it's it's to me a rehearsal tool of some kind. It's like if we yeah. want to if we want to play with how to how to feel. You know, it's like being drunk or what. You know. What I mean, it's it's sort of this. How do I get this so that when I can get up there, I can forget about it and just let it happen. You know. That's it's, right. It's rehearse it but, into your body. And and this is the paradox of actor training, or one of the many paradoxes, is that you have to work on yourself for years and years and years and years and years to then forget about yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But it's a great metaphor for life, Hugh. <laughs> That's exactly what we all but should what? do. <laughs> we totally should be doing that. All right. So what? So That's when I bring out this <laughs> magic law. Oh. <laughs> All right, so so now, okay, you land in New York, you're hitting the, you got the apartment, you're hitting the streets. Are you, I mean, do you get connections right away? Or are you are you getting some school connections where you get an agent kind of a thing, or are you just banging it out as a backstage? Uh, well, both. So originally, uh, we did a, a graduate school showcase, and we did it with the Denver Center, uh, that's no longer in existence right now. It was, uh, um. And we, yeah. And so Pat McCorkle was a cast. She still is an amazing sure. casting director. She brought me in the next day. Um, and um, yeah, in fact, it's interesting because probably I became an actor or learned how to audition thanks to Pat. Mm. Um, because she started using me as a reader ah. very early on. And so, you know, all these, the top actors in, in, in the city were coming in and I was just this beginning actor and I was looking and I was going, oh my gosh, that's how they do it. Okay, that's how they do it. Okay, that's how they do it. And then you sit in the room and you hear the conversation. Oh, that's why they cast them. Uh, all right, so let's, yeah. let's, let's stop right there because now this yeah. is like inside baseball. What were some of the things that you noticed right off the bat and that you've still taken to this day about that scary process, that audition process? So this is interesting, right? So I think, I think auditioning is in a way... A, I don't know, it's a, not a different art form because it's still acting. But um, I think what I learned was preparation is everything. Mm. I mean, the people that booked were the people that came in that were really off book. And they went to, they, they used that audition as a, as a time, however long it was, three minutes to 10 minutes to create a world. Mm. They're stor they, they were prepared. They had strong choices and they might not have been completely memorized, but most of them were able to at least go to a place in their imagination and say, if you cast me, this is how I see the part. They weren't waiting. The people that didn't get the part with people like, um, can I have some questions first? And then as right. soon as they said, out some questions first, you could just like cross their name off the list. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So there it is. Preparation and making a strong choice and, and, and letting it fly. And, and I guess we always have to look at it as sort of, it's a chance to perform whether you get the gig or not. It's just, can at I get the end to, of the day? I get to yeah. play a little bit. All right. So, yeah. so you learn this right from uh, Pat McCorkle, you're, you're doing reading and now you're going out on auditions yourself and what's happening. So originally I had been called back 
by WME, uh, which was crazy, right? So I started working with them. Um, and that was, I mean, I think my first audition was for Last of the Mohicans. Wow. Uh, if I recall correctly. <laughs> and I went on like 50 auditions and didn't get any. Mm. Uh, so they held me commercially, but released me theatrically. Right. And then I got picked up by uh, an agent who then uh, became my agent for many, many years, Alan Willig and Jay Kane. And Jay Kane is still in the business. He has talent work. Uh, and um, and I stayed with them. They were with uh, Patty Wu for many years. Um, and so, yeah. And so uh, they were sending me out. Um but at first it was, you know, like everybody doing stuff on backstage sure. and, you know, going to everything I could, um, equity, you know, open calls wow. and, you know, yeah. you know, standing outside of the building at 5 a.m. and, you know. <laughs> so what's that yeah. first gig that you get? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of gigs along the way, but the, for, the one where you go, fuck yeah, fuck yeah, I got that one. That's it. I, I got, I'm an actor. It's a good bit. Whatever it is, you know, what was that first one? Well, luckily enough, there was a casting director that was using me uh, uh, on all my children. Judy uh, um, was calling me in. So I was doing like day stuff on all my children and originally loving uh, <laughs> Judy, Wil Judy Bly Wilson. Mm. Uh, and, um, and so I was g getting stuff and like doing stuff and it was like, okay, at least I have stuff to do. Um, and then would do, you know, whatever small things, but I got my equity card doing, uh, George Etheridge's man of mode at the Oslo theater in Florida. Mm. Um, and, uh, that actually came through Anthony Cornish who offered me the job and he was the Shakespeare professor at Cornell. So he was directing this, you know, heightened language play. And because we'd spent a lot of time doing heightened language work at the university of Washington, I was able to have use the verbal alacrity that you need to do a George Etheridge play, which is just slightly pre restoration, um, uh, to, to do that kind of work. So let's, um, let's unpack that a little bit for everybody. So, so heightened language by that, you define it, how, how you define that heightened language play. Right. So it's written, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a meter, uh, like, like Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Right. Uh, so that would be, you know, uh, I am the contaminator, but it could be like Moliere is heightened language. It's, you know, Alexandrine, um, uh, but it is something like in the restoration comedies that the, the wit was expressed through the language. So kind of going back to our, what we were saying earlier, the action kind of does come up onto the language more. Um, so for example, a great example of heightened language is George Bernard Shaw. Mm. Uh, and it's less about what I'm going to make you feel with action with Shaw, but how I'm going to prove that you're wrong and I'm right. And you should right. see the world the way I see it. Yeah. And so all the characters in Shaw's world are going, see the world the way I see it. It's more kind of rhetorical in the sense of Greek rhetoric. Right. So if I can change the way you feel about something, I can change the way you think. Right. And so, um, yeah. And in the restoration comedies, a lot of it is about, let me, it's about status, right? So I'm using language to either right. seduce you or put you down or make myself feel better about my place in society. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, this is interesting. This is a question I have for you because I'm always curious about this, particularly, I mean, one of my favorites is Anthony Hopkins, one of my heroes. Yeah. Um, when you're doing this heightened language stuff where the, where the action is the text, it's on the text. It's not under the text. It's not the subtext. It's not psychological so much. It's on it or Shakespeare where it's in the argument, you know, the contrast, the, yeah. the blacks and the whites and the meter of it. That's where the, that's where it's happening. It's right there. You don't have to, are you still applying the sort of post uh, training, the post Shakespeare, Michael Chekhov, the Stanislavski stuff to a language or a text or metered based uh, actor action. I mean, how does that combine for you? Right. Um, it combines like riding a bicycle leads to riding a unicycle. <laughs> That's, whoa. Okay. Wow. Because you learn to ride a bike at a certain point, you're not thinking about it. anymore. At least I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> 
very complicated. It's been a long um, time but then you're like, okay, I'm going to try and get on this other bicycle that only has one wheel. So I have to learn what that is. Okay. I have to. I know how to balance on two wheels. That's psychological realism. Okay. Balancing on one wheel, that's heightened language. Interesting. Because the space between the thoughts is tighter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I'm responding to what you're, the argument, like you just said, the rhetorical argument that you're making, rather than the psychological behavioral circumstances. Right. So in, in Don Juan and Super, you know, um, in Don Juan in Hell, you've got the, you know, Don Juan and the Devil in Man and Superman by George Bernard Shaw. They're having this Shavian debate about the status of the world, which, by the way, has not changed one iota. <laughs> if you looked up and down the world lately, yeah, I have. And right. it's like, what? You know? So those two people are not manipulating their emotional lives as much, but they're going for the, I want you to change how you think about the world. Mm. So it's more like two lawyers in a courtroom, right? Right, rather than two people at a bar stool, um, and so you have to be able to handle that language, which is why people like Mackenzie, if you're, if you, and it's television, you have to speak thirty three percent faster on television than you do in film and in theater. Right, <laughs> that's right, and it's, so it's usually some for her, it's some kind of bizarre jargon that they're throwing at her that she's gonna exactly (laughs) might as well be shakespeare so yeah that's interesting so that i've always been fascinated by how you combine the sort of emotional realism with playing the text of a shakespearean play you know is are you still using your imagination even though there's nothing to imagine well to you yes because so 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 if you take the analogy of going from you know you learn in your body, this is why it's psychophysical to ride a bike that has two wheels, and then you go up on one wheel, you're still in your body. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I let go or make a conscious decision to not use what I've learned from Stanislavski and not use what I've used from Michael Chekhov. I think you do. Right. You just tighten it up into right. the language. Um, and you have to find a tighter balance. Mm-hmm. Because in those plays, there it's like this. It's There's no room for like this expanse of these moments, right? Right. Um, so, and I think at the end of the day, if you're thinking about it at all, you're in trouble. <laughs> right. That's you know what that should be the bottom line of this whole thing. Yeah. It's, it's, Completely, it's, it's called acting. You know, yeah, they did the thinking for you beforehand. You know, That's right. <laughs> you just go to the acting part. All right. right. So, all right. So let's just. I, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I want to get into some of the sort of brief. We'll get into some highlights of you as an actor because you've been. Uh, Oh, certainly all over the stage off broadway you did some broadway stuff too right Am I- yeah i was in brian friel's translations directed by howard davies i had a small part at the end and i covered michael Cumsty. so yeah. well so that's got to be cool right i mean broadway yeah it was great Very- yeah you know uh it's funny because i look back again the kind of schopenhauer you look back and you realize there's two things people said to me in graduate school um, one was I was teaching an undergraduate acting class and, and Robin Hunt, who is this amazing uh, teacher who used to be at the University of Washington. She's now at the University of uh, South Carolina and was a member of Tadashi Suzuki's company in Japan. She was overseeing us as teachers when we were grad students. And she came to watch me teach. And she, after the class, she put her hand on my shoulder and said, you're a teacher. Mm. And it's the last thing I wanted to hear as a, you know, I was like, what are you talking about? I, I'm 22 and I just want to act and I'm not a teacher, but you know, I look back now and I'm like, well, she was right. Right. The other thing, and this has to do with the Broadway thing is we had a, a, a director who I asked him um, after rehearsal one day, Patrick Kelly was his name. And he, I said, you know, you're a professional director. Like, what do you think I should work on and read to prepare? He goes, what's your name? I said, Hugh O'Gorman. You should read Irish plays. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's the crazy thing, Russ. So we had started the Mint Theater Company uh, on 311 West 43rd Street in 1992 with Kelly Morgan before Jonathan Bank took it over. And we were teaching classes out of there to pay the rent on that place. And... Um, and I was living on 51st Street, and I was walking from the Mint to up, up 8th Avenue. I think I'd probably had dinner at the Westway Diner or whatever at the <laughs> time, you know. 
And it's probably going to Arriba Arriba to have a, a margarita on 51st Street. And, uh, and this kid whose name escapes me now was a firefighter in the neighborhood. But he was also an actor. But his like, day job was he was a firefighter. Wow. And he literally went by on the fire truck and said, Oh, Gorman, <laughs> did you audition for translations? You'd be perfect. And the truck kept going. And I was like, what the fuck's he talking about? So the next day I called my agent and I said, you know, this is trans, this play translation by Brian Friel. They're you know, coming in. Can you? He says, okay, well, let me look into it. They called back and said, well, we can't get you in. So I said, okay. I found when the equity open audition was. I went and stood outside. Wow. Um, and I waited with everybody else. I can't remember who the casting director was. But I, I lied. I told them I was from Dublin. I was new in town. I said, my name is Hugh Patrick Joseph O'Gorman. You know, I don't have an agent yet. And so, uh, you know, so, but I, you know, this guy, you can call this guy. And, the whole thing. and so I did my party pieces. They called me back from that. They brought me into the office. They read me. And then I went in and finally read with Dana Delaney and I think Brian, uh, Brian Dennehy was. Wow. And so, and I just kept the ruse up the entire time. Wow. And, and we got to the end and Howard Davies, at the very end of the last thing he had me read, which was Dolti Dan Dolti. He said, can you read Dolti Dan Dolti? And I said, sure. And so I read it and he got done. He goes, okay, thank you. And as I'm walking out, he stopped. He goes, Hugh, he's British. Where are you from? <laughs> and I, at that point, I dropped it. I was born in New York City, sir. That's so awesome. And he then cast me and I understudied Michael. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, and so right. it's one of those lessons where you like it, that was athletics, though. I wasn't, you know, that was sure. like the training from being an athlete. Like, right. just because my agent can't get me in doesn't mean I'm not going to try and get in. Right. I've often thought about, you know, in the last uh, several years of this decade, I was like, maybe I should just go in and speak with an Australian accent and then, <laughs> and, yeah. then, and then break into my normal sort of New York tone and they'll be like wow what a great new york accent this australian guy's got because yeah. it seems that's all they're casting now is, is just new york right so yeah, what, what a great idea irish and i love the uh the fire truck guy that's awesome <laughs> it's crazy right it's totally just, true just like i think different. back now i'm like what the fuck it's incredible <laughs> had he not gone by right. in that moment right exactly that's how new york works <laughs> yeah that's why la <laughs> yeah, everybody's in their car. You got to knock it's on the window. <laughs> All right. So, um, so when do you get to start to doing some television and stuff? You know, when, when you start to, you know, and is that is it's all simultaneous? I would imagine. You know, you're yeah. It was that same year. So uh, translations closed, um, and a month or two later, uh, it came down in Pat McCorkle's office once again to me and Michael Cumstein. Mm. So we'd just been in this play together, and then AMC is doing their first, um, first series ever, and um, you know, long before Breaking Bad and Mad right. Men and all that. Right. And um, and uh, yeah, it came down to me and Michael, and I remember the two of us just sitting there. This is crazy, but it, <laughs> you know, anyways. So uh, yeah, and I got that. And here's here's how classy Michael comes to us. By the time I got home to my apartment in Fifty First Street. He'd already left a message on my voice machine back when we had machines Machine. that sat on the counter. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Press the button. And, and he, and it was like, Hey man, they couldn't get rid of me fast enough or something like that. It's a thing. Good luck to you, buddy. And I, that's, you know, people talk about competition being a bad thing. I always work better because I knew I'd see Michael or someone there. I'm like, competition makes me better. Actually. Sure. Sure. It keeps me from my own homeostasis. Right. And, um, and the other thing too, about this business and all of our business is it is kind of a, referral business too i mean everybody yeah. knows everybody and i know a guy who can maybe i'm i can't do it but there's a guy you know whatever and and you don't burn those bridges yeah. and, and it's, right. it's a brother and sisterhood so that amc thing that was the was that the radio one the correct remember when remember mm -hmm. when which was which did it win a sag award or we no we didn't it's so interesting because i'm actually about to do my voting for the sag awards today um <laughs> Uh, no, um, we didn't, but we were nominated for best comedy ensemble. Uh, and that was, you know, joyous, but yeah. the, the joy of it also was Rupert Holmes wrote virtually every episode of that. Now I've met a couple of geniuses in my life and Rupert's one of them. I mean, he, 
you know, besides producing Barbra Streisand's albums or writing the Pina Colada song and, you know, Mystery of Edward Drood, uh, you know, he wrote our TV show. And you, so again, coming back to the language, coming back, what do you do as an actor? And, and I, you know, having grown up with a mother, and this is what's crazy about it. My mother, there used to be something called the Sunday morning movie on, on PBS. <laughs> and every Sunday I would do my paper route and then sit down with my mother. And because my mother was, she would watch all these classic movies. So we would watch Philadelphia story, bringing a baby. So again, coming back to the verbal alacrity and the Howard Hawks movies right. and this kind of, da, 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 da. Yeah, was born on the side of a hill, you know, <laughs> Catherine Hitler, right? right? Right. Yeah. So that, you know, I knew how to do. So I got in the room, and so we, we got this, and then this was great cast. Um, just, to fill yeah, everybody, just, fill everybody just, in, just to fill everybody in, that show was it was it set in the 1930s? Uh, 40s. Like, 40s uh, radio show. You yeah, know, so it had, for, that, it had that sound yeah, and vibe to it. It was the, the patter, yeah, the, the comedic patter of a Howard Hawks movie. Um, how, yeah, how so long did we, that go for? How long did that uh, go? We filmed the night, so the pilots were 95, um, and then we filmed the last ones in 98. Okay. Yeah, and then um, they canceled the show, and it had to do with all the politics at AMC. They have new CEO, and then they started, you know, going in different directions. Right. So they stopped actually putting movies on. <laughs> right, but for but for an actor, good steady gig there for a few. It was great. It was great to have. So, and and you've gotten to do some uh, some great stuff. You know, you've you've done film work and guest spots and all that. You've you've had the working actor's life, but mm. now as we uh, as I get close to wrapping up, I want to get you into. When do you, when does that pat on the back that that one person said you were a teacher at 23, when does that now become a reality where you're like, looks like that's what I'm going to do? Right. So interestingly enough, I mean, I've been kind of teaching bits and pieces here and there, covering we stuff at the Mint Theater. Um, and then I had done a mini series for NBC called The Tenth Kingdom that brought it, we filmed in London for the better part of 1999. I mean, we filmed at Pinewood, but we were all over Europe filming locations. And from that, my now wife, then girlfriend and I, Natalie, decided, well, let's move to L.A. for when that comes out. And my agents were like, let's Judy Shane, who was my agent in L.A., was one of the original members of Writers and Artists. And she was like, it's time to be in L.A. So I moved to L.A. then for that and did a bunch of guest spots, as you said, after that. And interestingly enough, my wife's career as an architect, she got in at a firm where she's now a partner at. Oh, okay. And it's called William Hefner, uh, Studio William Hefner. And they do these incredible, beautiful homes all over L.A. and Southern California. And so we decided to, st we had sublet our place on 51st Street. And it was like, well, we'll stay in L.A. And I kept guest starring and stuff and doing theater out here. Um, but very honestly, I began to get depressed. Uh, and I started realizing that again coming back to what we talked about earlier i love being in the rehearsal room mm -hmm. i didn't need to be on tv and i didn't wasn't really finding the auditions that i was going on for three lines or co-star to be kind of gratifying in any way shape or form right. and so i'd been teaching and covering some friends classes and it's funny, these moments in your life, right? My wife turned to me one day and she's, I got to just preface this by saying she's French and she's from Paris. Okay. So she's direct. Gotcha. <laughs> <You're> direct. <laughs> and she said, I'm going to say something to you and you're not going to like it. And I said, okay. And she said, when you come home from auditioning, you are very difficult to live with. <laughs> but when you come home from teaching, you're filled with joy. Uh. And I think you should take a serious look at that. Wow. That's why I'm, I'm actually getting a little confused right now. I mean, it's like she changed my life, right? There's I mean, a, there's an effective memory right there. Yeah. <laughs> totally. yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And that's everything, man. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I, 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 probably around the same time or maybe a little later, I had this a similar thing because I was pounding around with a day job downtown and I worked you know, like an office manager while acting, doing Shakespeare at night and, you know, but just trying to pay the bills. But I, my office was right across the street from the World Trade Center. So that's where I was that day in 2001. Wow. And it's like, you start to go, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, I should be doing this right. completely, totally. Yeah. And that's and those moments in life teach you real fast 
where your joy is and, and, yeah. and how sick you make yourself when you're not even aware of, I was going home bitter every night, just working. You know, yeah. it wasn't pleasant to live with. I was married at the time. And uh, so I get I totally get that, man. It's that's what it is. So what so when you feel that, what's the what's the step? What's the decision? What do you do? Yeah. So there was some some contemplation <laughs> that needed to happen after that comment, that little tidbit. Um, so I think it was a couple weeks later, I sent out four resumes. Uh, I went, I got on what, you know, art search, this thing where they academic and I, I my, I was the son of a professor. My father had been, so I was like, well, universities, I could teach at a university, maybe I have an MFA. Mm. Um, and I sent out to, I think Cal state Northridge, UCLA, maybe USC and Cal state Long Beach. And this is where life really gets crazy. Is like, I got a call a couple, two days later from the then chair of the department at Cal State Long Beach, where I am. And he had been a fan of Remember When. Oh, wow. See that? <laughs> and he'd watched every episode. That's awesome. And he said, we have a spot open. Can you come down and guest? To, can you do a demo thing? And, you know, and I said, sure. When? He said, tomorrow. And I went, sure. Absolutely. And I came in, right? And I that, spent most of that night going through my graduate school notes going okay what am i going to do they said you got to teach two demo classes one is going to be an acting for the camera class so i knew what i was going to do in that class and the other was uh, a class for the graduate students and so i did i went and taught two demo classes wow. and they called me the next day and offered me the job and said oh by the way you're the head of the whole performance area and i was like okay wow. so the best the, arguably Russ, the best acting i've ever done in my life was the first year on the job acting like i knew what i was doing <laughs> Wow. That's and Mackenzie a, can tell you if it was any good. <laughs> a, well, clearly she was uh, quite impressed. That that's yeah. uh, that's intense, man. That's so so yeah, so that night before you're just like, okay, quick syllabus for tomorrow. Uh right. acting for camera and teaching graduate students. What was let me ask you, what did you teach what was the, the bent for the graduate yeah. students? So um I did uh for the acting for the camera class, I knew exactly what I wanted to convey, which is um, in, in, um, the book, oh gosh, what's the title of it? Uh, acting for the camera by, uh, not shirtless. Oh gosh. I'm spacing on the name, but anyways, um, he's he, acting for the camera basically comes down to a, a, a shift in distance of communication. Mm. So it's not that we do things differently. It's the distance that we do it in. Okay. Or, uh, to. Um, Tony Barr, that's the mm. author of acting for the camera. And, um, and so I did an exercise called, which we had done in graduate school uh, for the theater called When I Was a Boy, Little Boy, When I Was a Little Girl. And it's a dyad. You sit opposite each other and one person talks and one person listens. And it's a, it's a sourcing image exercise. And it's go, when I was a little boy, I, and then the image that comes, you talk about it. Had a, I had a sled. It was called a flexible flyer. And so that's the image that literally just came to me right now talking to you. Right? Rosebud. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So so I did that exercise and had one person sit off camera and one person sit on camera. Because for camera, you are doing things when you're when you're sourcing an image, you're actually playing action. Right. So I wanted to demonstrate that. And then in the graduate class, I wanted to demonstrate that I believe in a psychophysical approach to the work. So I did not psychological gesture with Michael Chekhov, but I did, there was a famous acting teacher in New York City called, named uh, Warren Robertson. And Warren trained like something crazy, like 70,000 actors from the like 60s, 70s, 80s. And um, but he had this approach that was called psycho psychophysical gestures. So you would go like, I take mine. I take mine. I take mine. And you do the gesture and you say the words until your energy meets that of a person who needs to take something. Okay. And then I would have the students go in the demo class. I had them go into prepared monologues that they already knew. Cause I was like, I don't want them working right, off right. material that I give them. I want them to apply this right. to them. So that so. psychophysical gesture is different from a psychological gesture in what way? So the classic psychological gesture is sort of the, you know, uh, it's it's you're indicating something physically right that's happening well, internally so my, well 
There's a jet. There's like a daily gesture, which is kind of what you just did, right? right? Um, then there's psychological gestures, according to Michael Chekhov, which is an archetypal gesture that you make to to stimulate a kind of primordial experience. Chekhov calls it the the charcoal sketch of the character. Mm. Um, that I, the character's reaching for something. Gotcha. And you may or may not use language with that, but it's a full-bodied reach or a smash or a pull or a lift. Mm. And so anywhere in the world, someone would say, oh, that person is smashing. Gotcha. And they're lifting. And that gets the energy that usually is attached to the moment before, where the character's coming from, into the body, and then take that energy into playing action in pursuit of the objective. Gotcha. It's like a lot, the psychophysical gestures were a suite of specific physical movements that were attached to specific phrases, mm-hmm. like goodbye, um, leave me alone, mm-hmm. um, I love you, I give you, you. Um, so, and you kind of you kind of look at the scene and go, oh, this is an archetypal goodbye scene. Mm. And so you know I have a tool to prepare my body, my nervous system, my breath, my imagination to go then into this goodbye scene. Right. And these are always sort of rehearsal tool. Like, in other words, it, it's... Yeah, prepar- right. or on set. It's pre- yeah, right. It's preparation to get yeah. into the thing. And then when you're in the moment, you know, it's, it's moment to moment work. But that stuff, is not, it's in your body at that point. I got gotcha. you. Right. Okay. All right. So, so let's get back to you as the, as the, as the prof, as the professor. So mm-hmm. you've been in this in Cal State Long Beach for, since 2002, right? Correct. And what was the other thing you mentioned, which was really cool that you're the, are you the chair of the, what, what's the. Uh, right. Along with, uh, along with Amy Hertzberg from the University of Arkansas, I co-chair uh, the National Alliance of Acting Teachers. National Alliance of Acting Teachers. Now, I assume that it takes people of all different, all of different disciplines that we talk, all the different schools of thought that we talked about. That kind of right. go. That's interesting. That's what's that like? <laughs> you guys all get oh, together and like you know hang out and share notes and shit. And what, what is that about? Well, you know, it's interesting, Russ. You would love it. <laughs> I'm sure I would. <laughs> I mean, I'm just meeting you today, but just, you know, but having watched a little, some of the, I mean, you would love this um, because, and I take this as a compliment. You're a total geek about this. Stuff. I totally am. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not the student you are. I don't love that as much, but I do love well, listening to it and talking about so, it. So, so this was actually. I have to give a shout out to J. Michael Miller. Uh, who founded the Actor Center in New York City, in New York City, and was the founding dean of NYU Tisch uh, grad acting, um, and he put that program on the map. Um, so I apprenticed uh, with Earl Gister and Catherine Fitzmorris and Chris Bays and uh, you know Lloyd Richards for a while uh, at the Actor Center in their teacher development program. And that was directly because I got to Long Beach and I was like, after a year of teaching my graduate school notes, I was like, I need more, like I'm out of my notes, you know? Mm -hmm. So I called Michael Miller and I said, I hear you have this thing called the teacher development program. He said, can you get on a plane? So a couple of weeks later, I was sitting in Earl Gister's acting class um, and and then Olympia Dukakis' acting class and not as an actor, but though we did act, but as a, with a bunch of people that were teaching. Right. So did that. I did that for five years um, with lots of different teachers. Ron Van Lu was one of the teachers there. Slava Dolkachev, uh, of course. Um, Bill Esper came in quite mm-hmm. often. Um, um, and then Michael retired, and he closed. Well, he then let go of the Actor Center. The Actor Center is still up in New York City, though it's we've separated the teacher development program from it. And when he retired, he turned to me and Amy and Peter J. Fernandez, who's an amazing New York actor and teacher at Columbia now, and Michelle Shea, who's taught at NYU for many years, and Emmy, I mean, I mean uh, Tony-nominated actress, um, and a couple other people, and said, would you, would you take over this program that's been the baby of, of the Actor Center for many years, the teacher development program? But I want you to approach all the people that had taken it Mm. By this time, it was almost a couple hundred over the 16 years that he'd run it uh, and start a society of acting teachers. And you can imagine we're sitting in a restaurant called Tree Bistro, which is no longer there on, in the East Village. And it was like, uh, I even have, I have a day job, like a full, full-time job, you know. But, and, of course, we couldn't say no. We said yes. Right. Um, and we've been running that since 2014. 
and it's now we have over, almost 300 members, uh, wow. 80 training programs wow. in five different countries. Uh, but the funny thing you just said is, you know, we would get together and we would run the teacher development program in New York for two weeks at NYU and then two weeks at USC. And then the pandemic hit last year. Mm. And we'd done a Congress every year for six years. We did a Juilliard and one year and then Manhattan School of Music and then New School. But then this, this, this whole thing hit. And what's happened is this whole new kind of mm, mission of the organization has come to the forefront, which is everybody's on Zoom with each other once a week now. Right. And so we actually are connecting more than we've ever connected because we're on Zoom. Huh. So we get together. It's early here on Saturday mornings in L.A., but I get my cup of coffee and we have conversations. And a lot of the time, the, thank goodness we had this this year because there was some, there's been a challenging year to be a teacher because sure. there's so much stuff bubbling up across so many different, which needs to bubble up, which needs to be addressed. Absolutely. But without the support of my colleagues around the country and beyond, it would have been a very, very challenging year, more more than it was. Well, I'll tell you, that's what that's that's affected every every aspect of our lives and it's it's this one thing there's two things that's come out of it is this and it's great for us as as uh, as artists is this immediate connection that we would have kind of put off because of travel we can now we we're forced to have it and it's a blessing in a lot of ways and we mm -hmm. have that like you just described and there's also this enforced self-reflection you yeah. know it's like let me reevaluate the stresses and importances of things in my life while I have this quiet moment. So those two things have come out of this pandemic and are really informing, you know, once we re-enter the, the world, whatever that world will look like in the next couple of months or whatever, it's going to be a, with, with different stuff, I think. That's right. Because of all this. All right. So I, I want to wrap up a little bit. And two things. One, let's go back to the very beginning because you mentioned you, you're going to you're about to vote for because uh, I get all my SAG screeners and everything too. But you said you're going to vote for your SAG awards. Let's go back to the beginning when you talked about when we talked about acting training versus non acting training, and you mentioned Francis McDormand in um, uh, Oh yeah, Nomadland. Where yeah. for people who haven't seen it's a great piece of work. First of all, as a cinematographer file that I am too, as a filmmaker, the guy did it with like a tiny pack it's like one camera and two led lights it's really documentary style and she's really the only not the only but one of the only actors you know it's it's a lot of like non-actors or yeah. regular folks in that piece it's a great piece so talk about what you were going to talk about with that about what she's doing and how you're blending the truth of the moment as an actor with tools with people who are just being right so Zoe Zhao, the Chinese director who directed that, usually just works with non-actors. Mm. Um, and so she, uh, if I understand the story correctly, Frances McDormand approached her uh, after seeing her previous work and had said, you're extraordinary. I want to help you produce your next uh, film. And so they had, there was a book that Nomadland is based on, um, though they've, they altered it very uh, significantly, apparently, from, from the book. Um, and then Zoe Zhao said, well, I want you to be in it. And Francis McDormand, you know, I, this is all, you know, I, I didn't talk to Francis right. about this. Right? I've heard this. I've read the paper. Um, so um, she said yes. And then they cast David Strathairn right. uh, to also be in it, who is incredible, as we all know. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, it's the ability to listen. Yes. And that's one thing we haven't touched on quite in detail yet, but that's everything. It's everything. Yeah. If, if if people, it's like, really, you could open up an acting school and go, you want to get better? Breathe more, slow down and listen. Right. <laughs> if actors would just do that, they'd get like instantly better. Right, right. Exactly. Stop acting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the first thing I ever learned and, and you just go back to it's like batting practice is my performance isn't mine. It's in that guy. That's right. You know, the moment you lose yourself you, or you pull you or you drop your lines or you pull yourself out of the play, uh, it's probably because you're up in here. If you just put the attention over there, you'd be right back in, you know. Okay. Well, we haven't talked about, I mean, the my favorite book. And here's my 11 year old. Hi. <laughs> you want to say hi? If you're going to come in here, you got to say hi. now. This is Marley. Uh, wow. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> oh, you got the right you got the right shirt on. That's where I'm coming. That's where I'm talking to you from, New York. 
<laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. I'll be done in a couple minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love the pandemic. The truth of the moment. <laughs> um, but we haven't talked about, I think is the best acting book written in, in 30 years, which is uh, The Actor and the Target by Declan Dollin. <laughs> and I couldn't believe when I first read it, uh, I was like, oh, every page was like, yes, 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 yes. And he's the artistic director of Cheek by Jowl that he runs with his husband, Nick, the, the, the set designer. Um, and they also uh, have a company in, in Moscow. But, I mean, it, it's, again, going back to athletics. If you're going to hit the ball, you got to be – it's like – it's the – what – Timothy Galway says in the inner game of tennis is if you want to get, you can't just see the tennis ball when it's coming at you. You have to see the scenes. Hmm. You'll appreciate this as a Mets fan. If you're going to, Mookie has to see the scenes when the ball, if it's coming at you hundred miles an hour, you can't possibly, you have to look at something so more specifically than in, than in everyday life. Right. And that is an artist. Right. Yeah. You know, someone has to take time to really see and to listen. What is it? Specificity is the, what's the enemy of art? Uh, what was the phrase? I always forget the phrase. It's something is the enemy of art. Just specificity is, I forget. I, I lose it. But it's it's about being specific about, you have to be, it, it's in the detail of, of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. And the ability to listen is, I mean, it's it's tied. It's in, You know, it's the old saying, I think it's the, you don't give a performance, you get your performance from your scene partner. Right, exactly. All right, so last little thing. In all this time, the thing that has given you joy, the, the, the getting into the study of it from the perspective of a student and from the perspective of a uh, teacher, what, what has this craft and the, and the immersion into this craft, what has it done for you and your soul? What, what would you say to somebody who said, you know, what was, was all this worth to your spirit oh gosh um i come with the heavy artillery <laughs> yeah okay uh well because i'm married to a french person <laughs> i will use a french term okay which is raison d'etre which literally translates as reason to be but it that's the literal translation, but it, we understand it as a purpose in life or a vocation or a calling. Um, I feel like my life's got purpose. Mm. I mean, what better than sit with young people every day and help them reach their potentials through great dramatic literature and imagination and human spirit and psyche. I mean, you know, just to be in there every day. And even on Zoom, I, I appreciate the fact that we have to show up with one another, you know, um, because at the end of the day, and this maybe goes to a more meditative thing that you were referring to about a year of self-reflection that we've all had is um, yeah, I got, I get up early and try to meditate, not every morning, but the mornings I can. Um, it's all about being present and acting leads you to you can't act well if you can't be present <laughs> right. like you can't be an, an olympic athlete unless you're present you can't be a, a great pianist and so the gift of life is being present in each moment uh and so acting the study of it and the teaching of it and the doing of it is presence work that's awesome that that you couldn't have said it any better that's exactly what it is and it and i find all these arts forms are just, they're always this sort of mirror up to nature, as Shakespeare said. They're a reflection of what we should be doing just when we walk out and out the door to the regular world. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's how you have to live your life. So, Hugh, I, I totally appreciate a man of your accomplishments and, and deep craft uh, getting into the weeds on this one with me. This, is, this sure. has been really a blast for me, and I, I, I really appreciate having you come on. It was an honor, and I appreciate you and your energy. And you played action to me and made me feel very welcome today, so I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah.